When Andrew was teaching in Sinope and came to Kherson, as has been recounted elsewhere, he observed that the mouth of the Dnieper was nearby. Conceiving a desire to go to Rome, he thus journeyed to the mouth of the Dnieper. Thence he ascended the river, and by chance he halted beneath the hills upon the shore. Upon arising in the morning, he observed to the disciples who were with him, See ye these hills? So shall the favor of God shine upon them, that on this spot a great city shall arise, and God shall erect many churches therein. He drew near the hills, and having blessed them, he set up a cross. After offering his prayer to God, he descended from the hill on which Kiev was subsequently built, and continued his journey up the Dnieper. He then reached the Slavs at the point where Novgorod is now situated. He saw these people existing according to their customs, and on observing how they bathed and scrubbed themselves, he wondered at them. He went thence among the Varangians and came to Rome, where he recounted what he had learned and observed. Wondrous to relate, said he, I saw the land of the Slavs, and while I was among them, I noticed their wooden bathhouses. They warm them to extreme heat, then undress, and after anointing themselves with an acid liquid, they take young branches and lash their bodies. They actually lash themselves so violently that they barely escape alive. Then they drench themselves with cold water and thus are revived. They think nothing of doing this every day, and though tormented by none, they actually inflict such voluntary torture upon themselves. Indeed, they make of the act not a mere washing, but a veritable torment. When his hearers learned this fact, they marveled. But Andrew, after his stay in Rome, returned to Sinope. While the Polyanians lived apart and governed their families, for before the time of these brothers there were already Polyanians, and each one lived with his gens on his own land, ruling over his kinsfolk. There were three brothers, Ki, Shek, and Koriv, and their sister was named Lebed. Ki lived upon the hill where the Bodichev Trail now is, and Shek tr dwelt upon the hill now named Shekovitsa while in the third resided Koriv, after whom this hill is named Koravitsa. They built a town and named it Kiev after their oldest brother. Around the town lay a wood and a great pine forest in which they used to catch wild beasts. These men were wise and prudent, they were called Polyanians, and there are Polyanians descended from them living in Kiev to this day. Some ignorant persons have claimed that Ki was a ferryman, for near Kiev there was at that time a ferry from the other side of the river, in consequence of which people used to say to Ki's ferry. Now if Ki had been a mere ferryman, he never would have gone to Zargrad. He was then the chief of his kin, and it is related what great honor he received from the emperor in whose reign he visited the imperial court. On his homeward journey, he arrived at the Danube. The place pleased him, and he built a small town, wishing to dwell there with his kinsfolk. But those who lived nearby would not grant him this privilege. Yet even now the dwellers by the Danube call this town Kievitz. When Ki returned to Kiev, his native city, he ended his life there. And his brother Shek and Koriv, as well as their sister Libed, died there also. After the deaths of these three brothers, their gens assumed the supremacy among the Polyanians. The Derevlians possessed a principality of their own, as did the Dragovichians, while the Slavs had their own authority in Novgorod. And another principality existed on the Polota, where the Polotians dwell. Beyond them reside the Kravichians who live at the headwaters of the Volga, the Dvina and the Dnieper, and whose city is Smolensk. It is there that the Gravitians dwell, and from them are the Severians sprung. At Belozero are situated the Ves, and on the lake of Rostov the Meria, and on Lake Kleschino the Meria also. Along the river Oka, which flows into the Volga, the Moroma, Chermissians, and the Morva preserve their native languages. For the Slavic race in Rus includes only the Polyanians, 
the Derevlians, the people of Novgorod, the Polotians, the Dragovicians, the Severians, and the Busians, who live along the river Bug, and were later called Volhynians. The following are other tribes which pay tribute to Rus. Chud, Meria, Ves, Muroma, Chadamis, Mordva, Perm, Pechera, Yam, Litva, Zmegola, Kors, Narva, and Liv. These tribes have their own languages and belong to the race of Japheth, which inhabits the lands of the north. Now while the Slavs dwelt along the Danube, as we have said, there came from among the Scythians, that is, from the Khazars, a people called Bulgars, who settled on the Danube and oppressed the Slavs. Afterward came the white Ugrians, who inherited the Slavic country. These Ugrians appeared under the Emperor Heraclius, warring on Hosros, king of Persia. The Avars, who attacked Heraclius the Emperor, nearly capturing him, also lived at this time. They made war upon the Slavs and harassed the Delebians, who themselves were Slavs. They even did violence to the Delebian women. When an Avar made a journey, he did not cause either a horse or a steer to be harnessed, but gave command instead that three or four or five women should be yoked to his cart and be drawn. Even thus they harassed the Delebians. The Avars were large of stature and proud of spirits, and God destroyed them. They all perished, and not one of ours survived. There is to this day a proverb in Rus which runs, They perished like the Avars. Neither race nor heir of them remains. The Pechnegs came after them, and the Midyars passed by Kiev later during the time of Oleg. Thus the Polyanians, who belonged to the Slavic race, lived apart, as we have said, and called themselves Polyanians. The Derevlians, who are likewise Slavs, lived by themselves and adopted this tribal name. But the Uradimichians and the Viatichians sprang from the Lyaks. There were in fact among the Lyaks two brothers, one named Radim and the other Vyatko. Radim settled on the Sos, where the people are known as Radimichians, and Vyatko with his family settled on the Olka. The people there were named Viatichians after him. Thus, the Polyanians, the Derevlians, the Severians, the Uradimitians, and the Croats lived at peace. The Delebians dwelt along the Bush, where the Volhynians now are found. But the Ulitians and the Tversians lived by the Denyser and extended as far as the Danube. There was a multitude of them, for they inhabited the banks of the Denyser almost down to the east. And to this day, there are cities in that locality which still belong to them. Hence, they are called Great Scythia by the Greeks. These Slavic tribes preserved their own customs, the law of their forefathers, and their traditions, each observing its own usages. For the Polyanians retained the mild and peaceful customs of their ancestors, and showed respect for their daughters-in-law and their sisters, as well as for their mothers and fathers. For their mothers-in-law and their brothers-in-law, they also entertained great reverence. They observed a fixed custom, under which the groom's brother did not fetch the bride, but she was brought to the bridegroom in the evening, and on the next morning her dowry was turned over. The Drevlians, on the other hand, existed in bestial fashion, and lived like cattle. They killed one another, ate every impure thing, and there was no marriage among them, but instead they seized upon maidens by capture. The Radimichians, the Viatichians, and the Severians had the same customs. They lived in the forest like any wild beast, and ate every unclean thing. They spoke obscenely before their fathers and their daughters-in-law. There were no marriages among them, but simply festivals among the villages. When the people gathered together for games, for dancing, and for all their devilish amusements, the men on these occasions carried off wives for themselves and each took any woman with whom he had arrived at an understanding. In fact, they even had two or three wives apiece. Whenever a death occurred, a feast was held over the corpse, and then a great pyre was constructed, on which the deceased was laid and burned. After the bones were collected, they were placed in a small urn and set upon a post by the roadside, even as the Vietichians do to this day. Such customs were observed by the Kravitians and the other pagans, since they did not know the law of God, 
but made a law unto themselves.